Good morning to everybody and good evening or good afternoon to all the colleagues who are watching us from Japan. Um, we are very happy to start the multidisciplinary seminar on contemporary Japan, uh, which is organized and initiated by the Josai International University and uh, we as Nicolas Romeris University are very happy to host it here at our university. Um, I will be a co-moderator of uh, the event. Uh, so my name is Audra Dergita Burokiene. I represent the International Office of the University. And um, I have a great pleasure to underline one very important uh, information. So we are long-term partners with Josai International University. And this event is really very special for us. The first agreement has been signed in 2013. So next year we will have 10 years anniversary of the signing of the agreement and there were exchanges going on. Our students were participating in excellent events at Josai University. Um, and uh, this seminar is also um, dedicated uh, to the centennial um, anniversary of the diplomatic relations between Lithuania and Japan as well. And have a great pleasure and honor to invite rector of Nikolas Romeris University, Professor Inga Jelenene, to give a opening speech to the seminar. Konnichiwa, uh, Lavas Ritas, good morning. Dear colleagues, students, honorable guests, on behalf of Nicholas Romeris University academic community. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome the participants of the seminar on contempor contemporary Japan uh, proposed by our strategic Japanese partner, the faculty of the Graduate School of International Administration, Josai International University. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to the president, Dr. Kenyi Sugibayashi, and all professors of Josai International University, who will share their insights today on key topics and issues related to current societal challenges, economy, business, and tourism. Also, I would like to thank everybody who have contributed to this important event. I would like to convey special thanks to Ambassador of Japan in Lithuania, Mr. Tetsu Ozaki, and also Ambassador Mr. Audrus Bruzga, who is the Director of the Department in Foreign Affairs Ministry of Lithuania. This year, both our countries, Lithuania and Japan, are celebrating the 100th anniversary of our diplomatic relations and friendship, and we, academia, hope this occasion would open new windows for our deeper understanding on, of uh, contemporary Japan and Lithuania, and promoting further our bilateral economic cultural, technological, scientific, educational, and tourism exchanges. There are no doubts that during this challenging to all of us time, it is necessary to help our business community and the entire society to navigate successfully towards sustainable peace and welfare. I warmly remember my first visit to Japan, to Josai University in 2015, when I met the former rector, Noriko Misuto. I was greatly inspired by Josai International University's youthful ambition and energy, its commitment to developing the young, young minds and encouraging their dreams and noble visions of working for the benefit of both local and international communities. Nicholas Romers University, which welcomed students from more than 60 countries this academic year, was established in free and independent Lithuania. We are the youngest pu public higher education institution here. Thus, we are still filled with youthful ambition and are 
eager to exchange cooperation and partnership with academic communities in Japan, as well as other countries in the Indo-Pacific region and around the world. I am confident that this seminar will be this new step of enhancing our cooperation. I wish all the participants a fruitful exchange through this great opportunity for networking and fostering Lithuanian-Japan friendship. Thank you for your kind attention. So thank you very much, dear Vector, uh, for very warm greetings. And um, uh, also we are honored and pleased uh, to open the floor to His Excellency um, Ambassador of Japan to Lithuania, Mr. Tetsu Ozaki. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this very timely and very interesting uh, joint seminar by uh, Mikora Suomeris University and Josai International University. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to uh, Professor Dr. Inga Jarinien, uh, Rector of MRU, and uh, Dr. Kenji Sugibayashi, a president of uh, GIU for this opportunity. Why well, it's uh, timely and uh, interesting? Because as you know, the rule-based global order faces big challenge, especially for a global free trade scheme. We have to admit that the concept of global free trade has been too op optimistic, where we believe global free trade can move the world equally as a whole towards prosperity with at the same time minimizing gap between rich and poor, and therefore towards democracy as the better political system, which unfortunately has not proved to be correct. So even worse than that, recently uh, there's been lots of talks and arguments that global free trade has widened the gap between developed and uh, developing countries and also the gap between rich and poor. On the other hand, Authoritarian regime has been uh, has uh, authoritarian regime has gained its power in uh, business, uh, typically with countries so-called uh, global south, as their approaches are very top-down, national interest-driven, therefore very quick. Uh, the approaches by the democratic big countries such as Japan, EU as a whole, and the United States, etc., are still more economy uh, business driven uh, and therefore much slower than uh, undemocratic competitors. More than that, as you know, democratic big countries have uh, had a struggle to get internal consensus for many issues, including trade issues, with more and more dividing society. Here I remember that the Prime Minister Shimonite, who described uh, this situation in a great speech on March 7th in uh, Seimas. It's two weeks after Russian invasion. He said like, she said like this, that's why Huntington beats Fukuyama. As you know, Francis Fukuyama declared the historical victory of democracy in his book called The End of History, uh, written just after Soviet Union collapsed in 1992. And Samuel Huntington, Huntington published his counter-opinion paper called The Crash of Civilization and Remaking the World Order uh, in 1993. This seminar is timely also because national security issues uh, of more and more dividing world are influencing very badly to the global trade, essentially for essential products. After Russian aggression to Ukraine, typically energy, food, chips, could be uh, treated like weapons by authoritarian countries to threat so-called uh, have-nots countries, including EU as a whole and Japan. Lithuania, under the current government initiatives, wants to broaden its business, business access to Indo-Pacific countries. Maybe uh, later, Mr. Bruzgasan, uh, Director of Indo-Pacific Area in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, will mention about this later. But given the recent joint announcement of Lithuania-Japan strategic partnership, 
there should be more, much more opportunities uh, for Japanese and Lithuanian companies can cooperate with each other. On the other hand, Lithuania has been very active to strengthen relationships with uh, other Indo-Pacific countries such as Korea, Singapore, um, Taiwan, uh, Australia, and India. As an ambassador to, of Japan to Lithuania, uh, I naturally hope that Japanese companies will have more business with Lithuania than these competitor countries. Here, I think Japan has some big unsolved issues inside, which I think will be focused in today's part three, the society's economy, society and economy, where I believe the historical issues around Japanese economy and Japanese immigration policy will be illustrated and discussed. Personally, uh, Dr. Uh, Towake Endo-san, who will talk about immigration and uh, social integration today, is an old acquaintance of mine, and I really look forward to listening to her presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for really wonderful and very warm words uh, dedicated to, to um, our seminar. And uh, now it's uh, my great pleasure to give a floor to Ambassador and Director of uh, Latin uh, Department of Latin America, Africa, Asia and Pacific at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, His, His Excellency Mr. Audrus Bruzga. So the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Rectoris Magnifica, Professor Dr. Jalenine, um, Rector Magnificus, Dr. Sugibayashi, Your Excellency Ambassador Ozaki, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to address the organizers and participants of today's seminar on contemporary Japan and bring greetings from Foreign Minister Gabrielus Landsbergis and also Deputy Foreign Minister Egidius Melunas. And I'm thrilled that so many of you have shown interest in tuning in today to get to know better Japan and Lithuania, to compare and contrast culture, traditions, arts, economy, lifestyles, business opportunities, and travel itineraries, that those two quite distinct and distant, but by all means inviting countries have to offer. There could not have been a better time for us to meet. Just three days ago, we marked in Vilnius a 100-year anniversary of our friendly Lithuania Japan relations with a spectacular event at the Martinez Majudas National Library of Lithuania. The Embassy of Japan, in collaboration with Lithuanian partners, had put together an exhibition paying tribute to a hundred years of friendship and cooperation among our peoples. The Yona Musica Choir, fresh from a concert uh, tour in Japan delighted us with a few Lithuanian and Japanese tunes. Many dignitaries and Japan aficionados came to celebrate the first centenary of Lithuania-Japan relations. And rightly so. About a month ago, a Prime Minister, a few weeks ago, um, a Prime Minister Shimonite paid a visit to Japan and together with Prime Minister Kishida, agreed to upgrade our bilateral relations to a strategic partnership. That in itself is a remarkable feat of straight statementship, uh, given the scarcity of time and resources available for them to negotiate. But the real beauty of this strategic partnership is that it brings the two like-minded countries together for close cooperation. And I quote from the, uh, from the text of the strategic partnership. The two, the two leaders agreed, affirmed that Japan and Lithuania had a long history of friendship and cooperation as partners, sharing fundamental values such as freedom, democracy, rule of law, and human rights. The two countries will um, continually share their assessment on the international situation and responses to challenges in the international community. The two leaders would work to, together to deepen the, national, the, the mutual understanding of the two countries through culture, sports, tourism, etc and promote people-to-people -people exchanges through expert exchanges, working holiday programs, etc. So there is work to do, and I therefore encourage all of you, and in particular students and young professionals and entrepreneurs, to take advantage of this favorable situation 
to establish partnerships, business models, to advance Lithuania-Japan cooperation. Our bilateral trade in 2021 grew by 10% and amounted to 165 million euros. In the first half of this year, Lithuanian exports to Japan grew by 24%. We want to see Japanese investments coming to Lithuania to benefit large infrastructure projects like railways, terminals, wind energy, logistic facilities. Prime Minister Shimonite, when in Tokyo, invited Japanese companies to explore high-tech, also food industry, opportunities in Lithuania. And Lithuania is a dynamic country, fast-growing and open for talent. We enjoy innovating, but we also like to share uh, to share a resource, um, um, what we have, just to save resources. And Lithuania is safe. We are fully integrated in the European Union and NATO. We believe in our European vacation, and we do what is necessary to make our European home safe, sound, and comfortable. Of course, there is war close to our borders in Ukraine. Ukraine is fighting a brutal aggression and needs our full attention and solidarity and material support to keep liberating her territory from occupation. Yesterday, rockets landed on the Polish soil, which is a stark reminder that the aggressor, Russia, has to be pushed back with resolve and collective action. Ladies and gentlemen, these are trying times for the international, for the entire international community. In Tokyo and Vilnius, there's growing recognition of the inseparability, inseparability of Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific security. Prime, Prime Minister Kishida made this plain in his comments at the Shangri-La Dialogue this year, when he said, they quote, Ukraine today could be East Asia tomorrow, unquote. Now, for this reason, we need to cooperate today more than ever, and I'm happy to observe that Japan has been actively involved in the strategic security dialogue in the Indo-Pacific and the Euro-Atlantic. Lithuania also wants to be part of this dialogue, and this is why we have worked out our own strategy for the Indo-Pacific. Guided by, the, by this strategy, Lithuania has been actively looking for partners in Southeast Asia, East Asia, and the Pacific. One great partner is here with us today. I salute our friends from Japan and wish you all a productive seminar. My last word of thanks goes to um, Violeta Gajoskete, my former colleague, I know uh, who was uh, very much instrumental in putting this seminar, seminar together. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Goro Komatsu, now hey, the floor uh, sound is a bit muted. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Goro Komatsu. I'm a uh, uh, allow me to introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Goro Komatsu, uh, Associate Professor in Economics at the Graduate School. Josai International University. Today, I'm honored to be here to be as a moderator uh, for this event, mark, uh, marking the uh, 100th anniversary uh, relationship between Lutheranesia and Japan. And to uh, celebrate the event, uh, we have a video message from uh, the Dean, uh, President of our university, uh, Kenji Sugibayashi. Konnichiwa and good morning, everyone. My name is Kenji Sugibayashi, president of Yosa International University, JIU, in Japan. Congratulations on the success of a multidisciplinary seminar on contemporary Japan. This <laughs> seminar is conducted by an esteemed university in Lithuania 
Nicolas Solomons University, MRU, and Graduate School of International Administration at JIU. I heard that Ambassador Tetsu Ozaki and Rector of MRU, Professor Dr. Inga Zarenyene, and professors of MRU are gathered here today. I wanted to say thank you in person, but unfortunately, I am not able to attend due to a previous commitment. It is a great pleasure to have an opportunity to, to talk to you all. As everyone knows that the spread of COVID-19 markedly decreased face-to-face -face seminar and conferences. On the other hand, it increased these kind of webinars and web conferences. We can easily communicate even if we live far away from each other. An online conference enables participation from researchers who in the past did not have the opportunity to attend in person. Inclusion of participants from diverse cultures and experimental backgrounds at conferences can foster a better scientific environment and lead to improved research outcomes. I believe that is why we can successfully have this seminar using online. I hope that this seminar will point out the current issues in Japan and lead to the discovery of solutions. In addition, I hope that this seminar will provide an opportunity to promote further exchanges between Lithuania and Japan. Finally, allow me to conclude with the heartfelt wish that it will be a fruitful conference. Thank you. Okay. And then, uh, okay, as a final remark of introduction, uh, please allow us to use a bit about our school. Okay. And allow me to share these slides for now. I hope uh, everyone can see the slides here. Okay. okay, as a last note, please allow us to introduce uh, our university, Josai International University, and our graduate school, uh, Graduate School of International Administration. Uh, as a co coincidence, we mar also mark a 30th anniversary here today, so it is our privilege to have a 100th anniversary, and at the same time, we make a 30th, 30th anniversary here in our university. Okay, and the, we offer uh, services that is very similar to your school. Our vision is to nurture a business and a public administrators uh, for a new era. So we strive to uh, educate or teach uh, the persons who are strong, both in public fields and business fields. In this sense, we share our same visions uh, among faculties. And to achieve the uh, vision, we have four core domains in our studies. And these four core domains each contribute to raise the person that is ready for the 21st century. And those four core domains consist of first, international politics and economic studies, international business studies, public policy studies, and last, we have tourism studies. And those uh, core study areas are supported by our distinct uh, curriculum offered here. Uh, for those four study areas, we offer a state-of-the-art, uh, currently advanced courses here. 
to catch up with the uh, world and the society now. For example, now in international businesses, we have data science classes because now uh, the data is the es essential part of 21st century. And also, as you see, we have uh, not only business areas, but also politics and policy studies areas. And okay, what's different? Uh, what's 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 the point? Uh, what's strength? What is strong uh, in our school? Okay, we believe there are three uh, strengths uh, in Tokyo area or it, compared to other university in Japan. Uh, first, our university is located at the very center of Tokyo area, which is called the Tokyo Kyoto campus. Uh, this is an ideal environment if you pursue both business careers as well as a public administrator's career. And we also uniquely offer uh, all English courses. And we uh, not only offer courses all in English, but the students can also take uh, classes, uh, the re relevant corresponding classes in Japanese as well. In this case, our university or our school is the only school that offers uh, those, uh, that offers both English and Japanese courses uh, to achieve our vision. And as I said that the, uh, this environment is suitable, the around the campus area, we have national diet or national theater, Akasaka area or national diet library and in Paris as well. And we believe that we are creating a future leaders here in Tokyo Kyoto campus. And okay, that's it for the brief introduction of our school. And now we believe it's time to move on to uh, our first session. Okay. Okay, now please, okay, continue uh, our uh, session. And now we begin uh, session one, uh, part one. Uh, we, uh, the, the topic of the part one is about business. And here, the first topic is sustainability in business, and it's offered by our professor Shigeru Matsumoto in International Business Studies. Okay, please allow us to introduce uh, Professor Matsumoto here and to give his uh, presentation now. Okay, Professor, please upload your file now. Yes, I'm doing. <clears throat> I'll show it to you. Okay, that's um, <clears throat> good uh, morning at uh, all those uh, at, uh, faculty and the friends, uh, students at the at, uh, university uh, there. At, uh, I am a, at uh, Matsumoto. I'm a professor uh, here at the at, uh, JIU. And I'm very uh, pleased to be a, at, uh, a part of the event. A, at um, commemorate this uh, 100 years of the at, uh, great partnership uh, between Lithuania and Japan. <laughs> Let me at, uh, introduce myself. Um, I have a at, um, <clears throat> um, background of the combination of a, a business and that academic. Um, I have been in banking, uh, investment banking at, uh, at the at, um, financial institution uh, like uh, HSBC and also PwC to advise those uh, Japanese company or international company to the acquisitions, mergers and acquisitions. And after that, that um, uh, I decided to uh, teach at the at, uh, university, the, at the business. Um, so my research uh, about, uh, uh, is a uh, international business, um, and uh, those are the kind of books I uh, wrote about it. Uh, so I'd like to share 
uh, uh, some of the uh, developments about the uh, sustainability in business uh, today at, uh, in, in Japan. Okay, so I, I'm sure uh, yet, uh, um, some of you have been in, in to Japan already, uh, but uh, I'd like to give you uh, some flavor well, how those uh, yet, uh, sustainability things are uh, going on here in uh, Tokyo and Japan. So first slide I'm showing here is the train. Okay, the train is one of the major transportation here, uh, especially in uh, like a large city in Tokyo. But you can see here, all that, that one of the train here is say, welcome to SDGs. This is a SDGs train. Okay, this is actually a uh, this uh, railway called a uh, Tokyo Railway. Um, so they are uh, uh, running at, uh, with a one hundred percent of a uh, uh, renewable energies. Okay. Um, so, uh, and then the, when you get in this train, uh, then there are a lot of educational uh, uh, materials available where the passengers can read about the SDGs. Okay. Um, so I guess now uh, uh, all the companies, uh, business communities, uh, and also the, uh, the people uh, are paying more attention about that uh, SDGs. Okay, so what um, I'd like to you know, that uh, talk and discuss with you uh, yeah, today is uh, yeah, it's, uh, why sustainability in business. And uh, I understand that in Lithuania, that uh, you have full of the, uh, you know, FinTech and all those uh, yeah, emerging uh, yeah, companies uh, is there. And the sustainability is of course, very important part of it. Uh, so I'd like to talk about that at, um, uh, by taking some examples uh, from uh, yeah, Japan. Uh, so I'd like to talk about the uh, this, uh, capital market and also the corporations, how those two are working on this uh, yeah, SDGs. Okay, okay first, a uh, yet uh, introduction: Why sustainability in business? Uh, you, know, you can see all the air pollution, contamination, climate change, everything. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you hear those things every day. And then waste, human rights, um, educational disparity. Uh, the, the world is facing a lot of issues. But these issues are not new. This issue has been many years, yeah? uh, but still not yet a yet to solve that yet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but now the yet, uh, business started to notice that unless the, the world is sustainable, or at least the uh, country or place they operate are sustainable, their business are not sustainable either, okay? But in order to make them in actions to contribute to sustainabilities, there are a lot of way to go, okay? And then we need to think about how, you know, we can make that. Okay, so let's start to look at the uh, uh, capital market and the investors. Um, as you can see, the uh, uh, most of the company pay, of course, attention to the uh, profit. Okay, uh, and also the investor, uh, you know, uh, to see how profitable companies is uh, in order to make a decision on the investment. Okay. So if we just let the company to run the business as a profit or rent it, uh, then there is not much, uh, uh, to, um, you know, respond to the, uh, the sustainabilities. So one of the things the uh, UN and also the uh, uh, institutional investors as a community, they come to the idea that that is the principles for responsible investment, PRI. Okay. Those are the capital market. I think they, uh, those of you students who are in that uh, majoring in the business or finance, you're pretty much familiar with this. Uh, but you see the capital market and also corporation and investors. Uh, yet, uh, they, they do all those investments and uh, issuing the shares, bond, uh, all the trade every day. Okay? Um, 
in the hist in the, in, in the past the profit comes first okay in, in order to selecting the company to invest but I, now the at um, UN and also the at uh, institutional uh, you know investors uh, at, uh, they come and to agree that capital market itself also need to work on sustainabilities okay how they can do that when they select the investees the corporation to invest and then they're going to have to have a very good agreement or principles uh, to do that okay so that's where this a uh, principle for responsible investment is kicks in and you can see here that uh, uh, that um, principle for responsible investment uh, it, it is to a uh, uh, make all those institutional investors to to pay attention to the uh, um, um, how uh, when they make a decision on the investment, that those investees are actually doing what about the uh, um, SDGs? Okay, all right, and, and then that uh, by those uh, uh, um, uh, you know they uh, select things of the uh, companies to invest with the uh, um, um, this uh, sustainability angle, uh, then that can be a very good influence to make the uh, corporations to do more work on the uh, their cities. That's, that's the, uh, the whole picture. And then you probably have heard about uh, this ESG. Okay, so when we think about the uh, what kind of uh, business or company are the uh, sustainable, first, you know they are gonna have to think about the, the environment. Uh, this is pretty much you are familiar with it. Uh, it's uh, the company who is doing a lot of a uh, um, you know contamination, air pollution. That's not gonna be sustainable, and also the society, and also the governance. Uh, so those three are the key elements. Uh, for the uh, sustainability, for the management, the managing the companies, okay? So the, this ESG, environment and the society and the governance are the one that yet, uh, uh, investors see how those companies are doing for the sustainabilities. And then when the investors see the uh, companies working very well on the ESG, they see those business and the company are more sustainable. Okay. What is this principles? Yep. The principle for the, uh, the responsible investment, um, <clears throat> actually, this is the process was a uh, convinced by the uh, United Nations Secretary General. Um, so, of course, you can see United Nations has a long history to make all those uh, industry and you know, the business to work on these sustainabilities. But in the, I would say in the past, there are some limitations. Okay, so United Nations uh, at uh, bringing there's a capital market or institutional investors to participate to put more on uh, to work on uh, to how they can make it those corporations to work on the sustainability and uh, this principle for the responsible investment is is the, the key things. Okay, and then those six are the principle. All right, so this principle or the institutional investors who sign this principle for that responsible investment, they're going to have to follow this, okay? They're going to have to follow this. So when that, um, that um, institutional investors sign that, then they, they have to pay attention that uh, all the ESG activities, environment, society, and governance, um, when they make decisions for the investment, okay? And then that's, um, um, you see this uh, signatory yeah, commitment. This is a commitment. So uh, yeah, um, uh, all that uh, institutional investors, they actually really committed uh, after signing this. And uh, you can see here that uh, it's more than uh, 3,000 institutional investors signed this already. Okay, and uh, including uh, 85 Japanese institutional investors. I, I would say uh, most of the major uh, 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 institutional investors here already signed that. Okay, and then the amount of the asset under management reached to the 120 
trillion dollar in 2021, which is a significant amount. Okay, so that, that means that that's, um, those are institutional investors who actually have a, this uh, asset under management, $120 trillion, they sign this, and then they are selecting their investee based on the principles. Okay, and uh, in Japan, uh, Japan is shifting to the sustainable investment, uh, followed by Europe, uh, followed by the US, uh, but this is the trend. Uh, yet the Japanese uh, financial uh, yet, um, uh, some communities, uh, the capital market communities, and the corporations, uh, you know, they are really shifting to this, you know, the sustainable uh, investment. Uh, I will give you a yet uh, example here. A uh, yet um, uh, Nippon Life, a uh, yet uh, largest a uh, yet uh, asset owner in Japan. This is a uh, life insurance company. Okay, they signed it at uh, this PLI. Okay, and then that uh, they signed it in 2017. Okay, so that means uh, still only five years. Okay, so you can see this is still a uh, yet the starting point. Uh, but they signed that, and then after they signed that, they are really committed to the yet um, <clears throat> a yet um, uh, this a uh, yet uh, PLI, and uh, they are shifting a uh, yet uh, their investment uh, to the a uh, yet uh, this a uh, yet uh, companies uh, uh, bonds equity who are you know they're pretty much following this set uh, sustainability activities. Okay. All right, uh, and then this is it's, it's, uh, you know following a it's, um, uh, what uh, Nippon Life is, is, is working on, and, and then that uh, this is of course a it's, uh, these activity will be a, a part of whole Japan's a, activities uh, to to achieve the yet uh, the yet uh, the goal for the uh, Japanese a, government set for the uh, 2050. Okay, and then what they do? So the uh, engagement, it's, uh, once they invested, uh, yet they all engage to discussing all the sustainability issue with the, uh, the companies they invested. Okay, so it's not just they uh, selecting the company, but uh, those are financial, I mean, the institutional investors, they also engage with the companies uh, yeah, to, to, to enhance the uh, sustainability things with the companies. Uh, and then that's, um, you know, ESG investment financing it. So that's, uh, for example, like a Nippon Life, they are increasing the, the amount of the, uh, um, uh, this uh, sustainability investment in uh, the last five years. Okay, and then how they do the uh, selections uh, or screening? Uh, there are uh, uh, many ways, but uh, a major one is negative screening. So the uh, they, you know investor can exclude uh, of the certain sectors, uh, companies uh, which are not really ideal for the sustainability or ESG, or they can go with a positive selections that uh, they are uh, going to select the uh, company or the project uh, selected for the positive performance. Okay, and as a result, uh, yet, so you can see here a uh, yet ESG investment. Uh, you probably have seen something like an index for the ESG you know, at, um, investment or something like that. Uh, so all those uh, institutional investors, um, you know, they, they set those they, uh, investment theme uh, for the uh, mutual fund or the index. Uh, with that, uh, they are, you can see here the increase for the investment uh, under the ESG angles. Okay. Um, so that is a, uh, what you can see. Uh, all those, uh, what the capital market is working on, or institutional investors working on for the uh, let the uh, the corporation to 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 contribute to the ES at um, the at um, sustainable uh, at um, development, and then that uh, we have a corporation side, um, fast retailing. Uh, yet, uh, this is like a yet, uh, Japanese uh, yet, um, SBA, a uh, apparel company like uh, Zara or H&M yeah, over there in uh, Europe, it's um, the fashion industries. 
but actually the fashion industry is the one uh, who has, um, uh, uh, you know, have a, a lot of things to do with sustainability. Let me show here. And that's, um, you know, when we think about the which industry has a yet uh, the, the worst for the yet the environment. Uh, you can imagine like a yet uh, maybe steel or the uh, yet uh, automobile uh, chemicals, uh, but actually the yet um, uh, textile industries uh, that is the, yet the second the worst industry for the yet uh, environment. And you can see how much they uh, actually pro uh, you know, those they yet. Um, uh, you know, a yet um, producing a, a, a yet um, a, a CO2 emissions, everything here. Um, so the, the, this fashion industry has a lot of to do with a yet um, sustainability. In, in, in Japan, uh, um, you know, the average person is going to buy at uh, 18th clothes and then dispose 12. Uh, but when when that the consumer dispose, uh, but almost 70% is going to be waste, okay? Instead of bringing it to the, uh, the store for recycling it, all right? And uh, you can imagine that when you use the waste, that's the additional, uh, you know, the uh, CO2 emissions. So what uh, fast retailing start to do is this recycling it, reuse it, and reduce, reduce that, and then they start to disclose how much they have made for the reductions for the energies use, uh, waters, everything, uh, to, to actually showing that. Uh, why they do that? Because as we discussed, you know, the capital market or investors start to pay attention to this. Okay, So in addition to provide all the financial statements, they also share this, how much they are working on it, and how much they could be able to reduce those uh, yet, um, usage of the water and uh, CO2 emissions. Convenience stores. Uh, there are uh, a lot of convenience stores here in Japan, like uh, uh, 7-Elevens and uh, those and everything. So what the 7-Elevens uh, convenience stores, what they have started is a pet bottle recycling system using reverse vending machines, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know the vending machine to buy the bottle, but uh, this convenience store, they start to, you know, uh, to, uh, to, to show this a, a reverse vending machine, the consumer to come and then, you know, at, uh, put that at uh, empty bottles, all right? And then that's a 7 Elevens, they recycle it and then re uh, use it again. Toyota. Of course, that uh, largest uh, yet um, automotive companies here in uh, Japan, the world, uh, they are very uh, much uh, yet uh, pay attention to this environment. Uh, they basically said that zero uh, yet uh, for the uh, productions, uh, also the yet um, uh, whole uh, value chains of the uh, automobile. Hydrogens. Again, um, Kawasaki, uh, they have started a uh, produce a, a, a hydrogen, uh, you know, fuel, and also the uh, carrier uh, for that. A, and then now here in uh, Japan, so you can see here hydrogen fuel stations. Okay, uh, instead of a, a gasoline, a, a gas stations. And then like a company like a Mazda, that's a car maker here, they start to introduce hydrogen vehicles. Okay, all right. So what's that uh, takeaway uh, from this, uh, at, um, you know, presentations here? Um, by the end of the day, uh, it's very important that, uh, uh, first of all, companies need to do more about uh, uh, this uh, sustainability things. But the more important thing is they also need to, you know, introduce or even educate and convince consumers to be part of it. Okay. You, you saw, you know, a, a the reverse pet bottles, a, a the bidding machines, you saw a, a fast reading doing for the recycled box. Uh, those things are very nice, but unless consumers really commit to do that, no much result, yeah? 
So it's it's very important that now the uh, all the consumer uh, people here in Japan to pay attention and do the actions. Okay. Good. So that's something you know. I, I'm at, uh, I was very uh, pleased to kick off all the series of the uh, seminar today. Uh, so that was the uh, end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, our Professor Matsumoto Sensei. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the presentation, Professor Matsumoto Sensei. And that was about our first presentation uh, titled Sustainability in Business. Okay, now we like to move on to the next one in our business presentations. Okay, and the next our presentation on business is about a history of Japanese uh, economic growth along with transport infrastructure developments. And the presenter is our pro associate professor, Professor Shinichi Ishii. Uh, Ishii sensei, could you please start your presentation now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm just. Uh... I can't share. Why? Can you see my slide? Hello. Okay, yes. So probably so you can hear my voice. And so uh, thank you very much for to giving me uh, opportunity to talk about the history of Japanese economic development along with transport infrastructures. So my name is Shinichi Shi uh, from the Associate Professor of uh, Graduate School of International Administration of Jose International University. So uh, today, uh, I just give me, so let me have a quick brief uh, introduction of myself is how to move on. Hmm. So the I actually so I was I joined JIU the last year. So before that, so I was a management consultant for more than thirty years. But that uh, working uh, with as a consultant for transport and logistics industry, and then I have a lot of experience for that. Uh, for to building to support the company to building a, a business strategy and marketing strategy and also supply chain management logistics. The most recently, I was involved in a, the privatization of infrastructure business in Japan. So and now I'm the teaching and lecturing here at management strategy and marketing and supply chain management and logistics. Today, uh, I talk about uh, topics about economic growth along with transport infrastructure. Uh, for example, the roadway and railroad and the port and shipping lines and ocean carriers and airport and airlines. So uh, in Japan, as you may know, as an island country, have, we have no you know, resources, natural resources. So we need to have the good the transport infrastructure to communicate with other countries. So the, the infrastructure development is very important. But 
So I think, and it is just the first the message to you is just we have that this is a uh, illustrate and economic growth by uh, GDP capita in Japan from the since the 1960. Uh, so we have the very the soaring growth at the 80s uh, 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 late 90s uh, 17th and 80s. So our GDP per capita uh, jump up and about the from uh, the the in 1980 80, it is about the 10,000 US dollar per capita, but uh, and then it reaches about and 400 more than uh, 40. Uh, uh, sorry, I just give me a second. So 44,000 uh, in uh, 1995. And then, so the staying the same level until the 2012, and we have a record of 49,000 uh, US dollar per capita. And then after that, the sharply dropped down. And now, so we are staying at the level of 40,000 US dollar level per capita. But actually, so Japanese, the transport infrastructure were well developed in mostly in 70s and 1980s. Uh, the before and uh, 1990s, the, we have already and uh, completed the nationwide expressway and Shinkansen the nationwide bullet train and also international airport and international port. So we had a lot of experience, the economic development and arising from G's and the international infrastructure, transport infrastructure. So I just want to give you a brief introduction of this project, uh, this development. Okay, the first three, I just want to introduce you of Japanese experience for transport infrastructure planning and investment. And so all transport modes are included with air and maritime roadway railway. So we have uh the nationwide that so our the nation distance of nation from north to south is about three thousand kilometer from hokkaido is the north part of japan to tokyo it's about 10 1000 kilometer and tokyo to kyushu area it is the west part of japan it's also the 1000 so we have the island is Okinawa. It's another 1,000 south from Kyushu. So we have all transport mode. So the, the one point is uh, we, we studied just the infrastructure development as a single independent project. But the in early uh, 90s, 1970s and 1980s, we have much uh, a lot of project with mixed functional project. That is a combination of the just not only uh, the infra transport infrastructure, but also with its uh, regional and urban development, like right, industry development and uh, city development, and that. For the one example is that it's uh, we have the basic rule for the development for the just it's uh, uh, in, in align with transport uh, the infrastructure. For example, so uh, we set up the, uh, the first and uh, the center of the city and the CBD, Center Business District, is more important the core of the urban development. It's, so we set up the urban infrastructure and station and business office and shopping center and hotels and housing and school and the hospital and the halls and all complexes are located concentrate in this area in the central business district it, it is so it's the center of tokyo so our university is located in this area and it's outskirts from the about 10 kilometer to 100 kilometer from cbd central business district so we have a lot of project along with uh, development of the housing, 
so in the road uh, railroad uh, the, with the railroad development and the combination of to this the type of development is the particularly of the private uh, sector participation is Japanese. So in Japan, we have a lot of private railway operator and then railway operator uh, uh, now developed a lot of housing and real estate. It's and alongside real estate area, uh, site area. So that is one of the characteristics of Japanese uh, development. And other one is that we have nationwide and developed and with the uh, expressway, expressway and high-speed railway and port and airport. So these infrastructure are used for long distance transport. So not and for the short distance. So let me move on to the road express development and related development. It's one is the nationwide express it's in Japan is now 9,000 kilometers. So the actually so development pace are now and very now slow at this moment. So we have already the almost most part of the expressway was developed in by just before 1990. But after that, we have the privatization of this expressway. We have now the six expressway company. They are collecting it all from the user and then so they are now and expanding and their business that means uh, so the maintenance and the for newly developed the expressway but some part is still supported by the government so road is uh, because the uh, toll revenue of roadway it's only the toll that is a very big impact for the user so still, and they have a yeah, little concern, uh, the supported by the government. But now we have the uh, the six, the private company in the operator as a uh, for the road. So I have to mention about the roadway and accessory related project is just is adjacent area of the interchange and just alongside with the road. So we have, we can have a lot of uh, the industry development, particularly for logistics center. So in the most recent, so we can see a lot of the projects that are directly related to the expressway. The reason why is, so the autonomous vehicle will be realized in a, I think in a several years. At that case, the automated vehicle that are drived with no man uh, be applied in the expressway. It is much more easier uh, compared with congested and, and complicated road in city area. So the now in the case of Japan, so we can see a yeah, lot of the development of the logistics center in just directly connected to the expressway. So this may and have a very new next impact for that. Well, another project is the railroad is so I just have so I just so only mentioned about railroad. So the we have the now the seven railway operator in Japan. The three major operator is uh, we have in a central island, Japanese island. So, and they have, they have already privatized. So these area operator are no more just a rail operator, but uh, they are real estate developer and also retailer. So they are using the, the advantage of the, their uh, own the terminal Terminal is they have a lot of the passenger throughput. So to have the business opportunity to provide them to a business opportunity. So now the Japan Railway is a railway operator have a, a lot of business opportunity. And that 
we uh, gives a uh, retail and very attractive shopping and also and as a facility as a hotel and as a so event space with like that so we can have a lot of the uh, terminal business in a, this area so the rebel operator so no and now no more just the operator so the next is uh, so we have the port so actually so you can see this is the japan island so we have more than 1000 port but the for as for international port we have uh, just a little bit more than 100 but major port, uh, we have a 20 to 30. So the one of the port uh, that we have, uh, uh, the, the, the government and uh, now the uh, emphasis for the uh, concentrate, the investment for the steel, the, for the port to have the competitive advantage uh, compared with the Korea and China. So, but unfortunately, so Japanese port are now in the very sort of the behind the level the compared with the Korea and China because the logistics, the volume are now very huge in China. So we can't compete directly with them. So the Japanese port are now considering to move on to the next stage for the, uh, to have more sophisticated software to match the good operation. So that this is the, the but case of the uh, one case. So I just want to introduce uh, one case of the port of Yokohama. It is a major port. It is now still, so the major business of Yokohama is now container. Uh, it's a container is a very uh, well, well, well and equipped as an IT, and they uh, were autom uh, automated and uh, terminal operation system. So, but actually, so Port of Yokohama have a lot of faces. For example, so actually the opening of the Port of Yokohama, it was a fishery port, but now it has the city development area and the industry area and the logistics area and also housing area. So they are now changing its role and adding additional role because port area is very close to the city. So they are now uh, receiving the expansion of the city uh, function as the office and hotel and housing. And also they are so uh, coordinate with the logistics function, but uh, logistics function is now so getting moved to the outer side because of the vessel uh, bigger and bigger and they need a much more so deep sea so they don't have uh, that and uh, accommodate uh, they can't accommodate a big uh, ship as the uh, the, the uh, area near to the city so these are the a uh, new requirement from city side and also the technology and development and uh, mature the bigger ship development so so in this so this technological and the also social requirement and the port area have now have the three function is one is the logistics other is the industry it's third one is a city so they have the city function as well so it is just introduction. It's, this is very specific and the land use for the mixture of the city uh, urban and city development and logistics and industry. So now, but uh, as I talk to and logistics is now is a very important part of the port of Yokohama because the they are the in terms of the cargo volumes, we can't com uh, com uh, we can't compete directly with China. Is China is a very huge cargo potential, and also the geographical location is the Korea is just 
the between uh, Japan and uh, China, and then it's uh, the, they are utilizing this location to receiving uh, the cargo from China, and so deliver to uh, so worldwide. That it may be a good location as uh, compared with Japanese uh, port in West part. So now, so in Japanese port are entering to the so IT uh, industry. So they are inviting a lot of IT industry that are related to supply chain management. So they have IoT and they are AI and big data. So all the logistics uh, will be now put into uh, the they are, will be changed with the automation. And I think that in the future, the logistics chain, chain from port logistics and warehouse logistics and, and vehicle logistics will be connected with the seamless. And there, so the Japanese is now, and the port industry are now changing to the IT industry. That is a, a big change. And for the last one is the airport and the airways. So we have the 102 airport, including the three major airports in Narita in Tokyo and Kansai in Osaka and Centra uh, Centra in Nagoya. So besides this airport, so we have the uh, other the three major airports in Hokkaido and Kyushu and Okinawa. So the these airport development are very interesting as actually so airport development are always uh, you know have the, some the trouble with the local people living there they have a noisy and something in environment impact but now the a lot of the the, the local people are getting under uh, understand it about the importance of international infrastructure. So now the conversation for the local people are now get started and then so move on to the regional development by using the international airport. So besides this uh, movement, so we have so another, you know, the regulatory reform as implementation of the PPP and PFI so that is the public and private partnership and private finance initiatives. So the, it's a nature for the transport infrastructure to have. They need a much initial investment cost. But initial investment costs are already bared by Japanese government, as I mentioned. So the most of the infrastructure uh, were developed before 1990. So now, it's uh, the important for uh, for Japanese to how to utilize as much as they can uh, to utilize the um, to maximum to uh, its capacity. To do that, so the government decided to invite the private uh, uh, par uh, sector's participation. So we have a lot the private the airport operator, and then the one thing I have to mention about it. So we are now exporting so uh, the operational system and the investment uh, system to the nation uh, worldwide. So we have the uh, Shinkans exporting the Shinkansen and the bullet train and exporting the airport operating system in other country and exporting the terminal operation in a port you know, outside Japan. So probably the next the, for the next step, so we have the, a lot of much business opportunity to have uh, by uh, uh, infrastructure management itself, but also including its the area development related to this transport infrastructure. And also IT and big data and AI will be put into practice with so this international in transport infrastructure that we so we can and move on the forward okay thank you for your attention it's that is my end of my presentation
Thank you very much, Professor Ishii. Uh, it was about a history of Japanese economic growth, along with a transport infrastructure development. And okay, please, uh, okay, well, uh, welcome our two professors who gave uh, presentations on uh, business and international business here. And okay, now let us proceed to a question and answer session here. And seeing the YouTube, uh, we have one question from uh, the chat, live chat. Okay. And okay, I'll read, okay, here's a question. Do you see any possibilities for involvement of Japanese business in transport and logistics project in Lutanesia? That is a question for Dr. Ishii. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, yes, I think so. Uh, we need to investigate the project because Lithuania is located in a very strategic location, I think. So now it's the world is now getting into very sensitive situation, but the logistics is always very important and your location is uh, uh, in between, you know, the EU and Russia, and uh, that is that uh, it's everybody understand its importance of that, and so in some cases, I think your uh, the land transport is international railway and related project, or I think it's the uh, airport project maybe uh, possible for that, but. Uh, we don't have any, so the, the, the you know, uh, concrete idea about that. So we need to move forward for the discussion about it. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ishii, and thanks for uh, the question uh, from the YouTube channel. Okay, it seems we don't have any questions uh, from the floor as well as from the YouTube. So please allow us to uh, go on to the next part. That is part two, in which uh, we probably present uh, two videos from our faculties of tourism and, and the regional development. Uh, for this part, we do something different, uh, not just giving uh, presentations by our professors. Here we prepare videos, uh, two videos uh, for you. So please enjoy these two videos from our professors.
Hello, everyone. My name is Hidekazu Iwamoto, an associate professor at Jōsai International University. Nice to meet you. I'm very glad to be here today. So I will have five minutes presentations. The theme of my presentation is about my business in the time of COVID-19 pandemic. This is my bibliographies. When I was a graduate student, I started to research in my business as tourism studies. So let's talk about what my is. Have you ever heard of mice? So it means meetings, incentives, convention, conference, and exhibition and event. So sometimes we call it convention industry or the event industries. So Asian countries are taking always measures in this field of global marketing. So in the current situation of my business, due to the COVID-19 outbreak, countries all over the world imposed stay at home and lockdown orders. In the past, we faced the major crisis and disasters for the past 20 years. But none of these crises and disasters have reached the level of COVID-19 pandemic. Please look at these figures. The number of the foreign visitors traveling to Japan in 2019 reached the highest record. But due to the COVID-19 outbreak, we are still 90% lower compared to the figure in 2019. This is a monthly statistics of international visitors in Japan. Japanese government will aim to have inbound tourism recover to pre-pandemic level by 2025. This is the current situation of the mice business worldwide. According to ICCA, the market share of virtual and hybrid meeting double in just one year. Now we are having an online seminar, right? Also, the data shows the number of the on-site meetings are gradually increasing. So this fact is very important in tourism studies. What are the challenges of my business in the time of COVID-19 pandemic? We will have to consider the risk management to prevent infections. The tourism industry is highly vulnerable to natural and human-caused disasters. So in the perspective of tourism studies, holding online meetings does not bring the economic impact to local areas. So it is important to host on-site meetings, at least hybrid meetings. So infection risk of the long-stay tourists tend to be lower than the short-stay tourists because of the deduction of the coming and the going of people. Last, we, um, my business should offer more opportunities to attract people from the countries around the world. For example, inbound tourism in Japan is mainly centered on the neighboring countries, such as East Asian countries. Using the lessons learned from COVID-19 pandemic, we need to find ways to make my business sustainable. Thank you very much for your attention. So I hope you will enjoy this seminar. Thank you. Okay, thank you for watching uh, two videos by our professors in tourism studies.
Uh, they are currently the issues pertaining in Japan in tourism industry, as well as uh, the uh, post COVID-19 uh, issues in industry. Okay, now please, okay, the time is kind of early, but please allow, allow us to proceed to part three of today, which is about society and economy. And we have three presenters here in this session. And for the first, uh, I'm privileged to have a presentation on macroeconomics and Japanese economy. A title is a bit different uh, from the one that we have posted before because uh, we have a shortened uh, presentation time. And the, we come up with something that is uh, very interesting in this uh, today's presentation. So uh, again, my name is Goro Komatsu, an assist associate professor in Graduate School of International Administration of Josai International University. I'm teaching uh, many quantitative subjects such as uh, macroeconomics, business economics, statistics, uh, data science recently, and econometrics. And sometimes we teach uh, career development to foster uh, the, our students' understanding in their career making. Okay, let's go to uh, my presentation. Okay. okay, now the presentation is about Japanese economy and secular stagnation. Uh, as many of you know, uh, one of the salient features of Japanese economy that the uh, the economy that we have experienced is called secular stagnation. Uh, secular stagnation means like a large and long stagnation. And it happens in our cases uh, at uh, 1992 or 1993, when we have a clash of a, a bubble economy. And that large shock affects our GDP output level below it, uh, its pre-bubble trend. And we also explain, experience very low and resilient inflation. Uh, this low and long stagnated output is called uh, output hysteresis. Okay, let's take a look, take a look at the figure here. Uh, here uh, I found uh, two time series for Japanese and European uh, output level. And the blue line shows the output levels. And the one in the above is the Jap Japanese output. Uh, it is projected in 1992. And then the number is indexed to 100 in 1992. And you know, if Japan can keep uh, its economic growth and the output is supposed to grow in this uh, straight line. But actually what Japan has experienced is the line below. The level of output experiences is uh, just stagnation uh, from 1993 and up until today. And actually this is not uh, what happens only in Japan. Uh, US has also experienced similar stagnation uh, they also call it secular stagnation after the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, you see that there is a trend line and some estimate of potential GDP. And these estimates are based on the data from 90, uh, 1980s to up until 2007. So the projections are very good. But actually, after the financial crisis, U.S. economy stagnated. And it actually, actual GDP actually diverges from uh, the potential or estimated line. And the same goes uh, with the Eurozone area too. Uh, the figure shows uh, two uh, GDP, actual GDP and the potential level of GDP. And in the Euro area, uh, this, the crash, the financial uh, crash has uh, just affected uh, the uh, level of output in uh, the level that is far below the projection. 
So after uh, the financial crisis or the bubble clashes, uh, many advanced economies uh, just experienced the similar experiences. And the, uh, the, the first country that is hit by this secular stagnation is Japan. And so, okay, so what's the problem here actually? Okay, uh, when something uh, big, some shocks happen, you know, policymakers uh, should react to recover its economic uh, growth. So, okay, what we address today is to uh, talk about the issues or challenges of current policy models. And this is actually a part of my, just a tiny part of my ongoing research. And we will have some mathematics here too, but you know, it, I, I think it's better to have like a variety of presentations here today. So from me, uh, let us show some like mathematics or economics uh, behind uh, Japanese economy. And the you know, current uh, policy models that is widely used throughout the world is called the New Keynesian Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium Models. We call it uh, DSG, or sometimes we just abbreviate it as like NKDSGE. Uh, it is based on like some critics uh, we had back in 1970s and 80s. So we have like a full-fledged model it has a ground theory, uh, which is called the micro foundation. And we also incorporate a state of the art expectation uh, augmentation so that we can also incorporate how uh, uh, consumers or firms react uh, to the information in the future. And since uh, uh, this works great in the normal time, uh, this is uh, used in like IMF and the many central banks in the world. This is actually the workforce policy models. All right, but still, uh, you know, we have secular stagnation and output is going away. And actually this DSG models just cannot replicate this output diversion called output hysteresis. Uh, the model is a very uh, sophisticated model, but still we cannot uh, predict the output going far away from the trend. Why? Because uh, if we create a models, I mean equation in the system, if some variable goes far away from, you know, the, from the other variables, then the, actually the model blows up so that we cannot define the model in the first place. So the challenge here is, to, okay, how we can create a model that can replicate this output hysteresis under this workforce framework. So today, uh, we just preview a new Keynesian DSC model of output hysteresis. Okay, so now let's take a closer look. Okay, now you see uh, real personal consumption expenditures in the U.S. economy. Uh, the Personal consumption is closely related to the output. So here, as an example, or some illustrations, I just put this figure now. And you see there are like two major shocks in the economy since 2000. One is the financial crisis in 2008. And if the, it, when, when the economy is hit by the crisis, then output goes down, then it never goes back to its pre-crisis trend. Actually, it's below the pre-crisis trend for all the time up until, even up until now. Okay, this is the, uh, the hysteresis effect. But you see the second crisis here, we have a COVID-19 crisis. Then we have lockdowns and the people just suspend their spending and the uh, shops are closed, then we, uh, you know, reduce consumption drastically. But after the COVID-19 is almost over, then we recover our consumption and the GDP is right on the track, like back on its own track again. So, you know, there are two major shocks, but the reactions of the economy are so different. So what's happening here? Okay. Okay, first allow us to see this model. 
Okay, usually, as you may know that we have, uh, when we think of the economy, we create this kind of diagrams. It's called the aggregate demand and aggregate supply diagram. So at the intersection of the economy's demand and supply, uh, the output level here, which is denoted by Y, and price level, or sometimes inflation, is determined. And here, if economy is not hit by any shocks or everything is going okay, then economy is believed to be at potential level, which is denoted by YN. Okay. So this is like the track here. When there's like no major shocks here, economy evolves over time, like in this straight line. And this is a potential level of output. But when economy is hit by something, then the economy moves away from the potential. Okay. And this is the situation. Like in, two, uh, in 2020, we are hit by the COVID-19 shocks. And when it is called the demand shocks, and when demand shocks occur, output moves away from its potential level from E to E prime. So aggregate demand moves like goes up or down. In this case, it goes up, but in the case of COVID-19 shock, it goes down. But in our model, it must go back to its potential after shock disappears because it is the level that output must uh, come back when the shock disappears. So there is no way for output to be permanently away from its potential level in this uh, new Keynesian model. And the new Keynesian model in its simplest form, uh, we have two equations here. The aggregate demand that we have mentioned is denoted by this equation. Output yt is, as I said, is determined by future output expectation and the nominal interest rate and the future uh, expectation of inflation. And this DT is actually a shock, like COVID-19 shocks or bubble shocks. And this is a demand side. And the, in supply side, inflation is then decided by the future expectation of inflation and the gap between the current output and the potential level of output. Okay. And this kappa and the beta are just uh, some parameters here. So here, uh, these two equations are the simple new Keynesian model. And the problem is here. Okay, sorry, some equations. Okay. So why we cannot have hysteresis, in output hysteresis in the model? Okay, as told, uh, in DSG model, uh, many equations, in this case, aggregate supply curves is derived from micro foundation called the stackard price optimization. And in this price optimization, the optimal price is actually chosen in a way to make firms markup, that is firms uh, profit, uh, to be its optimal level, which is called a mu, which is the optimal markup level. And that is the that's uh, is expressed in this equation. The point is this markup is a constant. It doesn't affect it by time. It's chosen in the price optimization by this model. Okay. And since this is constant, that means that this is the optimal point. And this corresponds, this markup profit is corresponds to potential level of output that the vertical line we had before. Okay. So if the price optimization suggests that the markup goes to this constant level, then output must goes back to its potential level as well. Okay, so this mean reverting feature is called a stationary or stationarity. Okay, whatever happens to the economy, this output eventually must goes to this potential level. Okay, so we say that output is stationary to potential level. That is, you know, in this traditional new Keynesian model, output cannot be non-stationary. It cannot be non-stationary in this model. So this is a problem 
And this is what the central banks is facing, the problem central bank is facing right now. So the question, the quick question here today is that, okay, how can we replicate uh, this non-stationary output under this simple yet workhorse new Keynesian DCS model? And here in this today brief uh, presentation, I'll show you one way to create this model. Okay, the key idea here is to uh, add uh, differences in output in this model. Okay, well, I, I guess if you are interested in finance areas and so on, uh, you know this. Okay, non-stationary variable, some variable that goes away, actually these variable often become stationary if we take differences or if we take the rate of changes. For example, uh, when stock prices are non-stationary, uh, stock prices are going moving up and down, and we don't, never know that it goes forever, it goes down forever. But if we take the rate of change of the stock prices, then the, that rate of change the differences are stationary, right? So, and if it is stationary, we can use it to create a model, okay? So the idea is what if Okay, our DSC models can be constructed with differences in output. Okay, in by saying differences, uh, we denote this by like a delta. So it's a differences between output current level and output uh, old level. So what we would like to do is that okay, can we make output at like a non-stationary variable? But at the same time, we want our model expressed or constructed in non-stationary variable. Okay, this is what we would like to do. Okay, so how we do that? Okay, now my idea is that the price optimization that we mentioned, okay, we try to express or rewrite it in terms of historical output so that we can create hysteresis. Okay, there's some like technical jargons again here, but please recall that the markup is related to price level. Okay, price in price optimization markup is chosen in association with price. And also you see that markup is related to output too. So there must be another relation between output and prices. And actually in the new Keynesian model, that relation is actually given by a uh, goods demand among firms, which is given by this equation. It's like a good uh, output among uh, different uh, firms is expressed as the price difference in time and optimal price here and the aggregate price here. Okay, the point is this equation is very similar to the previous equation here. And we can also associate this markup to output here. Then we just plug in to the original equation and rewrite it. So the optimal price equation is now in this form. And the, now the, this output level is determined in this equation. Okay, the optimal output level is decided by the previous output times gamma and some target output level here. And we call this gamma as uh, the strength of hysteresis parameter. So we believe this parameter controls the degree of hysteresis. Okay, the enough for the model explanation. So what we get is this uh, simple hysteresis new Keynesian model. Uh, this is a new model we create here. And now it is composed of two equations. Okay, and the, for the aggregate demand side, this equation is the same as before, but what's different is this one. Now we created a new supply curve, which is, we call it a uh, hysteresis supply curve. And now this curve, inflation is determined by the two factors of output. Okay, one is a factor, which is one minus gamma times some parameter times difference in output. And the other one is gamma times changes in output. And by doing this, we create a 
hysteria, we try to create hysteresis in the model. For example, you see that if we set the parameter gamma is equal to zero, that means we have no hysteresis. So this last part disappears and we only have uh, output level and the potential level of out output. But if we set the gamma parameter is equal to one, then the first term disappears. Then we have a full hysteresis uh, aggregate supply model. Okay. So with this new supply curve in hand, now we try to see, okay, what's happening here? Okay, so these are the model comparison. Uh, we compare the result of simple New Keynesian model and our model, hysteresis New Keynesian model. And now we set the hysteresis parameter is equal to zero. Then you see that the green lines, a basic simple New Keynesian model and uh, no hysteresis model are very similar here. Our no hysteresis model is not just a toy model. It just replicate the original model very well. So we believe that it is kind of general model here. But as we see, we also have a hysteresis effect. So we put hysteresis parameter to 0.9. Then you, let's see what's happening here in the output. Now output shows some hysteresis effect here, even after the shocks disappear in like 10 quarters. But output still lingers down. Then we put the hysteresis parameter is equal to one. Then you see that output is always, and it keeps below the trend. Okay. Then you see if we put the parameters and set the years to 30 years like Japan, and then output just keeps away almost forever. And we call it demand shocks create unique root in output. Okay. And if further shock occurs, this output going down and down and down and down. So this means that we can actually create the secular stagnation of the Japanese economy. Okay, there are some caveats, but if you uh, want some questions, I'll ask it late. I'll answer it later. So the takeaway for today is that okay, consistent with uh, DSG's model. Now we can show that even simple model can create a Japanese secular stagnation. Okay, uh, I talk a bit too much, but thank you so much uh, for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much. Okay. okay, now we move on to our second speaker. Uh, it is our Dean, uh, Professor Toake of Graduate School of International Administration. And today we have uh, her presentation on immigration and social integration. Okay. 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 Can you see the slide? Not yet. Okay, okay now, now we are preparing. Over there, they said they okay. can now, see now, the slide. Now the slides are coming. Coming? What yes. about my publish? And can they hear me? Yes. It's on. All right. Professor, please. Okay. Hi. My name is Toake Endo. Endo is my last name. And uh, I'm the uh, professor of political science and uh, dean of GSIA graduate school. And um, I, at the uh, JIU, I usually teach international politics, American politics, political risks, among others. But my personal research, professional research interest include international migration and the policies, deportation regime, nation states, and or nationalism. Okay, so today I will talk about Japan's immigration and um, migrant integration into the Japanese society. Let me start with the brief history of Japan's immigration. Before World War II, Japan was a nation of both emigration and immigration. It sent its citizens to Hawaii, the US, Canada, and South America, as well as millions of Japanese citizens went to its colonies in Asia and the Pacific. On the other hand, Japan received immigrants from Korea, Taiwan, and the other colonies as cheap labor. After the war defeat, Japan had no specific immigration policy for decades. 
Instead, it encouraged the emigration of its superfluous population to South America and internally control of foreign residents focused on former colonial subjects, mostly Koreans, who are seen as a national security threat. Today, uh, the state, Japanese state, carefully avoids the use of the term immigration or immigrants, I mean, since it keeps its long-standing no-immigration policy. Instead, it prefers the word foreign worker or the talent acceptance. So in this talk, I use the terms of immigration and the foreign worker acceptance interchangeably for the sake of convenience. In the late 1970s and the 80s, Japan had a dazzling economic boom, as you saw that uh, in the presentation of Professor Ishii, and uh, uh, growing demand for labor. And uh, Japan tried to fill the uh, labor gap by allowing uh, foreigners to work with illicit visas. Illicit visas such as uh, tourist visas, um, whose folders were from Iran or Pakistan who worked in construction or entertainment visa holders from Thailand, Philippines and South Korea, predominantly women who worked at bars and the massage parlors. Uh, this illicit migration caused the social problems and the backdoor, this so-called backdoor policy was widely criticized. So to reduce undocumented migrants, the Japanese government uh, prepared the quote unquote side door by revising immigration law in 1989. As a result, Japan recruited uh, semi-skilled workers for, uh, for manufacturing and assembly plants among Japan's co-ethnic um, group called Nikkeijin, mostly from South America. And Japan also gained basic workers in farming, construction, textiles, and the food processing, and the, the uh, so-called TITP program, training program, or technical intern training program. While making these side doors, Japan kept its orthodoxy of no immigration of low-skilled foreigners. By the way, this TITP skill training program has been under the uh, heavy criticism um, internally and domestically as a cause of the labor abuse and the human rights violation. For instance, U.S. State Department called this program modern day slavery. And then came the Great Recession in 2001, as presented, explained um, uh, quantitatively by Professor Komatsu. And the uh, economic plunge led to the massive layoffs of Nikkeijin South American workers. But the demand for less skilled labor was strong, in fact, throughout the recession period, which suggests that the gravity of the Japan's demographic problems of aging and the depopulation. So Japan counted on the TITP migrants, as well as Ryugakusei international students from China, Vietnam, Nepal, and the other Asia. In this phase, uh, these quasi workers grew large, comprising of more than 40% of the total foreign worker population. Okay, as this chart shows that the migrants in Japan increased exponentially, um, in the past several decades, uh, while specific, uh, but the, after the uh, recessions, the um, specifics go that in this chart, that uh, very light blue one, okay, which were the South American Nikkeiji migrants, their shares declined, whereas TITP and the foreign students grew in that you know uh, darker blue colors. Okay, and um, in 2019 was actually the peak year of the foreign worker acceptance, totaling that um, 2.93 million, which is a triple of 1990s 1 million. By proportion, uh, the currently 2.25% of the national population are non-citizens. In 2018, the immigration law was changed again because the um, well, the you know uh, the new law purported to replace that the faulty TITP program and gain more temporary 
migrants. So that means that the, for the very first time, Japan officially allows the less skilled migrants, labor workers, uh, with the work permit called the Tokuteigino or specified skilled workers visas. But this the poor, unfortunately, that the poorly designed program did not fare well with fewer than expected applicants from overseas and the COVID-19 related immigration restrictions. Well, overall, I would say that the Japan's immigration policy has been a strict rotation policy. Uh, by strict rotation policy, I mean that the Japan actively imports temporary workers while avoiding migrant permanency. Japan is far more enthusiastic uh, about labor incorporation, importation rather than the human incorporation. And, at, at, and it's inarticulate policy compounded by the insufficient inad inadequate support institutions and programs for migrant protection and their smooth integration into host communities this is causing a gamut of strains such as worker exploitation abuse disappearance poverty uh, limited or no access to education or health care arbitrary detention of irregular migrants um sorry there is a actually the class of foreigners that japan still now does not welcome much refugees and asylum seekers uh, by the way refugees issue of refugees had a very significant meaning to lithuania and japan well because of chune sugihara mr sugihara was a wartime consul to your country lithuania who saved the lives of more than 2,000 Jewish refugees from Poland. But his country, home country, Japan, has been closed to world refugees even today. Japan is actually the state party of the United Nations Refugee Convention since uh, 1981. But um, as this chart shows that you know, Japan has not recognized or received most refugee applicants, the um, orange or the you know brownish bars um, signify the number of the refugee applicants, and the red uh, numbers in the bars uh, represent the actual number of the accepted refugees, which has been at you know like a forty-seven at best. Well, by the way, that the most recent number was um, I think last year uh, was seventy something. Uh, refugees was accepted, but still it is 0.55% at best, which is pathetically low by international uh, liberal standard. Under such circumstances, Japan's current acceptance of Ukrainian evacuees and Japan's uh, warm welcoming attitude toward the 2000 uh, Ukrainians is, is rather unusual, or it may be an outlier. Um, this, you know, Kotoden train, um, it's that's running in the Shikoku Island. It, you know, it shows that, you know, how much, you know, Japan is ex extending that the well, uh, warm welcome to the um, Ukrainian war evacuees to Japan. Um, besides Ukrainians, however, Japan remains aloof or cold to other world refugees, such as Afghan, Rohingyas, uh, Kurds, Syrians, to name a few. Japanese state also makes a clear distinction between Ukrainians and the other refugees in acceptance policies, programs, as this uh, tabulation shows. I mean, this is a uh, uh, summary that I created based on that, you know, difference of the acceptance program. On the left-hand side, oops, excuse me, Ukrainians, um, evacuees, their acceptance conditions this is quite similar to the uh, what they call the convention refugees which is like a i would say that you know full refugees that you know japan you know accepted with full responsibility okay but when it comes to afghans or the myanmar's japan uh, the refugees from these countries or syrias or rohingyas japan you know still puts the very strict conditions the refugees or the evacuees cannot come alone, I mean, cannot come with families, and they have to have a Japanese host before coming over to Japan. OK. 
Okay. And even Ukrainians, Japan still does not call them refugees. They are called evacuees or hinami. Okay. And uh, what happened to those foreigners who are not recognized as refugees? Well, if not recognized, they are subjected to deportation. And if those uh, deportees refuse to leave Japan, they are subjected to detention. Okay. And the deportation and the detention is an emerging fault line in Japan's immigration policy, which is a, my main focus of my recent study. The deportation regime causes many strains to foreigners, such as refoulement of refugees, family separation, tensions between detainees and officials, death of detainees, and a lawsuit. Well, this picture was uh, the rendering of one of the you know, deportees and uh, who were detained in a detention center um, before the Tokyo Olympic Games. Okay. And uh, as this chart shows that the number of the deportees seeking asylum and the fighting at the court uh, for their refugee recognition status had been on a rise. The situation uh, is drawing that the domestic and the international criticism of Japan's cold treatment of asylum seekers. But this fraud system endures. Okay. So in a nutshell, the Japan's you know, deportation is and the detention is uh, instrumental for Japanese state to strictly manage migration, to import a flexible workforce, and to curb undesirable immigration and the migrants' long-term settlement. And this is the poster uh, made by the local police that depicts the danger of the illicit migrant workers, okay? And, but you know, regardless of what the state, Japanese state wishes, the ethnic and the cultural diversity is a reality of today's Japan. Okay, and uh, as more foreign workers migrate from many sources, the more diversified Japan's ethnic landscape becomes. Uh, people from 195 countries migrated to Japan, mostly from China, followed by Korea. Vietnam, Philippines, and Brazil, and many others. And despite uh, such ethnic variety, Japan has not come up with a good strategy to effectively integrate foreign residents into society. And uh, uh, perhaps that the state, Japanese state assumes or they expect that the migrant stay in Japan is temporary. So that, you know, like a no specific or the no effective uh, integration policy is necessary. Uh, do we have time? Yes, we have a lot of time. A lot of time? Okay, all right. Well, um, to demonstrate the, oh, oh, first, you know, like uh, to be fair with the Japanese government, I have to introduce that the Japanese government most recent uh, migrant um, integration or the multicultural coexisting program. That was the very first um, national program addressed by the Japanese government starting from 2019, okay, to support foreign workers' amicable coexistence with the Japanese society in communication, work, and the everyday life, okay? However, um, it's Japan's such effort is not, has not been evaluated positively According to MIPEX, which is that um, a very popular index of migrant integration policy by government, uh, as of uh, 2020, Japan's uh, integration policy scored 47 points, not out of you know 50 points, 47 out of 100, and which is below that MIPEX, uh, MIPEX average. Japan is also uh, classified as integration denied or immigration without integration. Uh, Japan has been weak in terms of anti-discrimination policy, political participation of foreigners, or education of migrant children. So the Japanese state is not really fulfilled um, its responsibility for migrant protection or integration. But you know, it's rather it seems like you know they are shifting that support duty to subnational uh, actors such as local governments and the NGOs. 
Okay. And uh, I wonder about how appropriate and uh, suitable, sustainable, this is what I would call the devolution of uh, responsibility approaches, given the increasing foreign worker, po foreigners' population and their various needs and wants. And in addition, local support, most recent book of Open Borders and the Open Society. Thank you very much for your listening. Okay, My that's it. Most recent book. On the open thank you very much for your listening. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Endo And the okay, we have actually plenty of time. And the, now we actually would like to uh, ask you one question from the YouTube chat. We okay. have uh, one question from YouTube channel. Mm, could you read it? Yeah, and it says, I read, do you think the workforce or students from other countries will influence the position of students or workforce from their own countries? Um, I'm not sure about, could you read it again? Okay, sorry. Maybe I did not read it okay. well. Okay, once again, do you think the workforce or students mm. from other countries mm. will influence the position of students or workforce okay. from their own countries. Okay, all right. Now I know what you mean. Thank you very much for uh, asking the question. Well, since we have one more presenters, I'm going to make my uh, answer very uh, quick, and maybe we can discuss it later on. Yes, it does influence, especially when uh, the you know, skilled migrants from developing countries uh, migrated to Japan for uh, income, which we call that the brain drain. Uh, that has been at the problem of that nurse and the doctors migrate, uh, which are in a very short supply, not only in Japan, but in Korea, probably pretty soon in China, in America and Europe. And, uh, you know, like, uh, for example, Philippines is the major exporters of the care workers. And those migrants, you know, they, instead of serving the patients or the elderly or the needy people at home, they migrate to the advanced countries and you know for them you know like the income is just far better than their home country but you know they tended to stay there long leaving behind that you know like the needy population at home and that has been that you know major concern not only by the immigration scholars but the world bank okay um which you know in a long run which may you know um, carry the not uh, short run and the medium run, which may be that you know brain drain. Okay, uh, even though that you know those migrants um, you know send that you know remittances money back home, which may you know contribute to, to some extent, but um, you know like in terms of like a training of the future nurses and doctors, if they don't have a current doctors at home. You know, like uh, there's not enough professors in the medical school or nursing school. So that is a concern. Okay. Uh, I hope, you know, I answered the part of your question. Thank you for asking. Professor, thank you for the answer. And here, in the meantime, we also have another question uh, in the form of two chats. Actually, it's a one question. Mm. And I'll read. I've heard some opinions that the special, special Specified mm -hmm. skilled worker visa, mm -hmm. Tokte Dino, mm -hmm. is lowering the general worker's level mm -hmm. and creating more social problems due to the massively immigration of foreigners. Mm -hmm. And could you please share your opinions on this program? That's the question. Okay, Tokte Dino, which was kicked off in 2019, and uh, 2000, yes, 2019, but you know, that was. Um, almost, you know, virtually suspended because of that, you know, COVID. Japan had a very severe restriction of the inbounds. So we have not seen that actual, you know, outcomes, how effective this, you know, like a low skilled migrant acceptance policy, Tokte you know, policies. But, you know, like, a, it, yes, it has been very criticized um, by, Many, especially those you know who are concerned about that you know, foreign workers' well-being and um, uh, welfare and the human rights, 
uh, because that it's clear that this, you know, uh, S, uh, specified um, worker visa uh, targets the low skilled laborers in constructions and uh, um, restaurants or the assembly plants, well, which are, you know, very, very much in a dire need of the labor force. Well, by the way, that interesting convenience stores, which always need that, you know, foreign workers and are always filled by international students, Ryugakse from developing countries, they were not, you know, included in this program. Okay, so uh, that's another side of that, you know, poor design of this program. But uh, it may be a little bit, you know, too early to make any critical assessment how, you know, um, effective for the employment side or the how, you know, um, concerning this program in terms of the human rights side. So we shall see. We have to keep an eye on it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor. And actually, there is. Uh, sorry, my 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 mic my microphone was off. Uh, okay, now we have finished two of our three uh, presenters in this session, and now okay, please uh, join me to welcome uh, again the Mrs. Audra, uh, the moderator uh, from Nicholas Gomez University, to present uh, the last speaker from Nicholas uh, Romers University. Uh, Mrs. Audra. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, we are really grateful and uh, followed with high interest uh, the presentations, uh, all presentations from Josiah International University. And uh, thank you very much for the part three presenters, both uh, Dr. Goro Komatsu and Dr. Uh, Toake Endoch. And now it's a great pleasure for me to pre present uh, Professor Paulus Pakutinskas um, of Nicholas Romeris University, who is also uh, head of the uh, um, law school legal tech center. So he is a professor, academic, and uh, probably practitioner as well, uh, who is always on the edge of the most advanced topics which are relevant um, uh, to, to uh, legal topics and technology-related topics. So, dear professor, the floor is yours. Okay, sorry, could you hear it? Okay, so I just uh, like to repeat that um, I'm a big fan of uh, Japan and it was a really big pleasure for me to, to participate in this event. Um, and I'm starting from, from initial slide where you can see uh, Cherry Blossom, what is very important uh, event in, in, in Japan. So, so um, that's uh, nice how, how people uh, enjoy the nature. And um, my presentation is more comparative uh, and it's not related to law. Uh, maybe we will come back to, to law, what, what I know very well, but um, I'd like to, to, to discuss um, our similarities, uh, how we are uh, similar when we are so different um, as we know. So uh, do you have anything uh, common? So yes, we are humans, we, we, we live in this uh, planet, so, so natural that we have something um, common. And um, what about geography, which is uh, quite a uh, uh, simple fact. We are quite far of each other. But the issue is that uh, between us, uh, there is just one a neighbor, big, big one, uh, if we do not count uh, Belarus, but anyway, that's really a huge uh, country, uh, our neighbor, uh, which creates, um, let's say, some problems for both of us. But anyway, so, so uh, the, the distance can be measured in this way or in another. If we um, measure in kilometers, it will be 
quite far. So history, if we live so, uh, so far, so maybe um, uh, we do not have any history. And it looks like that we have something uh, what we can uh, share. Sometimes it's good, uh, uh, sometimes it, it's bad, but uh, uh, we, had, we have uh, one sad period in history, uh, or, which was um, um, in, in, in last century, in the beginning or middle of, of last century. So there was uh, deportation and imprisonment of Lithuanian citizens. And at the same time, uh, there were uh, 600 Japanese uh, imprisoned. And it's interesting fact that uh, uh, 38 places uh, were identical. So that means that it is a possibility that there was some communication, some, some relations. And we can read it from uh, books and other sources that Japanese met Lithuanians, or sometimes they called uh, 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 people from Baltic countries. And Lithuanians are mentioning in their uh, in sources uh, that they met some Japanese uh, prisoners. Uh, do we have anything bright on people who unite? And everybody knows that, yes, we have it. And it was mentioned, and we are remember remembering it uh, every time it, it was really a nice and brave uh, person so we we, we are proud of, of such persons uh, in in our history in, because he's a part of our history and we keep uh, relations and his son uh, was visiting lithuania so that is nice um, uh, nice uh, relation between our countries do you have other uh, people? Yes, our politicians are doing great, great uh, job, and they are um, <clears throat> meeting and contacting, and there were uh, nice, nice uh, visits from both sides in, in different uh, uh, formats, and uh, there were formats uh, uh, with the premier ministers uh, this year. So, so that's and that we are keeping our relations quite tight. When we say that um, uh, we have something, uh, we can be uh, some in, in, in common, so we need to, to, to look at traditions. And it looks like they are really different, but uh, could we find anything similar? So yes, it looks like that we, we like some things that are quite, quite uh, similar. And when we talk about the national bird, when it's talked, it, it, it could be understood in Lithuania that it's national bird. We, we, we like this um, um, bird. We never hunt it or do something harmful for, for this. And we know that crane is, is absolutely uh, important um, bird in, in Japan. So, and you can see they are quite similar. So they are big, they are nice and, and and white and black so you need, you know that's there is some similarity here yeah religion religion is a very big part of uh, of culture of tradition of society and it looks they are absolutely totally different and we can't find anything similar but we can uh, look from uh, another point uh, there are two main religions at the, at the moment in 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 japan it is uh, old one uh, uh, Shintoism and uh, uh, newcomer. Let's call it newcomer. It's not so new, but Buddhism. And uh, what is nice in, in in Japan that they they, they can survive uh, both of them. So what about Lithuania? So we, we had our old culture too, and now it's uh, we like it um, re reborn. Uh, there are some some people who like to to let it, it uh, uh, practice and, and, and uh, uh, keep it uh, as a tradition. And Catholicism, uh, Christianism, which, which came from other countries uh, and is quite similar in general as a B Buddhism. So, so it's big, big uh, religion. So what we have uh, similar in society, it's uh, demographic, demographic problems. Um, eldering is is an issue for, for both uh, societies. And um, 
that means that we uh, have the same issues to solve. What about economy? Uh, so we can see that um, uh, Lithuania uh, imports, it was um, uh, last year, 87 million. So the, the partner number 32, it's not the highest um, uh, uh, rank and exports is uh, 13, uh, 39. So what, what are main goods? Uh, um, so main goods, 40% uh, of, of them are lasers and chemical products. And we will come back to lasers because I like to talk about um, high tech. Um, that's, that's a very important part our, uh, of our relations. So when we talk about Lithuania in context of EU, so we can see that we can do a lot uh, to, to be in higher position. Mm, so just a few countries are uh, importing um, uh, less than Lithuania. So we have a lot of space to, 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 to work. And uh, when we talk about exports, it looks like quite quite similar so so the the balance is quite okay but uh, we uh, have much more potential to 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 work here and as i mentioned the important uh, place of our relations uh, is lasers uh, because lithuanians are really good in uh, lasers and uh, in some kind of lasers is uh, second place in the world of production and uh, as we know in a lot of uh, uh, high-tech products uh, we need um, lasers as as a part of um, of solution of uh, of um, product so looks like that's good so what about facts so we have some companies who who are working uh, quite intensively Expla is one of the, the, the laser uh, produ uh, producing uh, companies and uh, they work with um, Japan uh, Spring Research Center and the, the products are used in Hitachi products. So that's a huge company. Uh, the Japan University of Science have chosen uh, Expla as their partner. So, so they, they have uh, represent, uh, representatives in, in Japan, so it's really important market for, for Expla. And uh, here we can see um, a lot of our um, lasers. Um, Konas Technikas University collaborates with the National Institute of Material Science. So that's, uh, that's uh, another high text. So mainly uh, the, the fields where we can talk that we, we can have very good uh, cooperation except food industry which is um, a bit more uh, simple issue but we will talk about it anyway so that is biotechnology um, IT lasers semiconductors uh, and and chemistry uh, here it is uh, uh, the the um, uh, sentence is uh, from our famous uh, professor, Vitotas uh, Mizeikis, uh, he works in, in Suzuka um, uh, University and he is inviting his uh, colleagues to come. Students are coming to this university and he's doing a lot of nice uh, uh, things here. Uh, and I just uh, can uh, read his, his uh, thoughts. Um, I, I live uh, and work in Japan, far away from my native country of Lithuania. Still, I often uh, get reminded about it through my work. When I hear about new results achieved by Japanese companies and universities using lasers made in Lithuania, by being able to design and deliver state-of-art laser systems and uh, pot uh, photonic uh, components, Lithuanian laser industry increasingly contributes a new scientific discoveries and technological breakthrough on the global scale. So that is really good um, possibility for Lithuanian laser industry to, to be uh, represented in, in a global scale and, and by, by huge and important uh, Japanese uh, companies. Yeah, so these facts maybe were quite uh, 
uh, known. I just just have something uh, looked what what is unusual uh, and what maybe you don't know. I hope uh, so. Do you know this uh, this uh, trademark? These who were in 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 Japan uh, maybe can remember. It's it's uh, uh, the biggest uh, own Japanese. Uh, um, chain of restaurants, uh, so it's owned by, by Japanese. If you if we take uh, McDonald's and and uh, Starbucks, it could be third. Uh, so, but but it's uh, the biggest, and there are more than one thousand five hundred um, uh, restaurants in in Japan, and they they are expanding in other countries. So I'm not going to say that it's owned by Lithuanians uh, for sure, <laughs> that because it it, it, it isn't. So how it is related? So so we can go here. That is menu, and it looks like everything usual and like like okay. The issue is that um, all this uh, it depends how we call it uh, scargo uh, uh, or or snail. Uh, they are coming from Lithuania. Totally all uh, the the. Um, um, uh, restaurants uh, um, uh, supplied uh, from Lithuania, and why it's unusual because that is not Lithuanian food at all. It's it's French uh, food, uh, uh, but uh, here in 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 our country, uh, the the snails are a very good quality, and the, there is a, a quite big business. And uh, I know these people who are exporting. Uh, it's it's really interesting relations, and and you know. To, to be a part of a huge uh, um, restaurant chain is, is really a um, uh, very, very nice, very nice result. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to say, when, when we're talking about, about um, uh, high-tech technologies, uh, um, business relations, uh, uh, it is very important to to have good regulations, good laws and regulations. Uh, here I'm coming to, to my subject, uh, very few words about it. And EU is very strong in regulation. Uh, we have a lot of uh, um, regulations, uh, specific regulations, new, advanced, and ambitious. Uh, we all, all, all of us, we know GDPR, which is um, which was an, an issue for other countries to, to reach the same level, but now there are coming a lot of other issues like like uh, regulation of artificial intelligence, data regulation, not 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 uh, especially um, uh, personal data, but any data, because without data we can't survive, we can't create uh, uh, big products. And other uh, digital um, uh, regulation, digital market acts, uh, digital service act. So, so there are a lot of issues what we can uh, provide as a good uh, or bad practices. So, uh, yeah, you you can come to to Lithuania to study um, technologies, uh, laser technologies, business administration, and other issues, but that's not my subject. I can say that uh, you can come to study law. It looks quite strange because uh, law is quite national uh, thing, but we have our LLM course where, where you can uh, use uh, uh, the best practices of EU, and it's just one year, so you can receive uh, um, after this one year a lot of knowledge in technologies and uh, regulation of technologies and diploma of uh, EU. So that's my message thank you so thank you very much dear professor uh, paulus pokotinskas once again for a really amazing presentation very visual and really um i hope that uh, everybody who listens uh, who hears here found that there are quite a lot of similarities between two countries, although far away, uh, located uh, physically or, or on the map, but uh, really quite close in a virtual or in a, um, how to say, 
in a virtual uh, way. And uh, now, uh, thank you once again. I don't see that there are any specific questions uh, in, in the chat. Um, so I presume we don't have uh, any questions at the moment. Thank you once again. And um, uh, this was the end of the part three of the seminar. And uh, in order to step further to the closing of the seminar, I kindly ask um, uh, Professor Darush Titilis, Dean of the Faculty of uh, Public Governance and Business, uh, to, to share his final remarks uh, regarding this uh, interesting, really interesting uh, seminar. So it's time for final remarks. Uh, it's an honor for us uh, that such a meaningful event took place today uh, remotely. Uh, so many interesting and very relevant topics uh, we can see. Uh, and these topics are certainly relevant to both of our universities and uh, the, both of countries as well. Uh, Lithuania was uh, relatively uh, recently rebuilt uh, its independence uh, needs uh, reli reli reliable partners, including uh, Japan and surrounding region. And the partnership with Japan is developing su quite successfully in a general sense. Uh, Japan in Lithuania's second, is uh, Lithuania's second largest economic partner in the a Asia region. Uh, over the decade, the trade turnover between uh, Lithuania and uh, Japan has increased uh, sixfold. Uh, therefore, closer cooperation between uh, Japanese and Lithuanian universities in the field of education is a logical and even necessary step. Uh, I would uh, see a huge added value for our university and our country for, from this collaboration. Uh, our university and the Faculty of Public Governance and Business, uh, we have in, in place economics, logistics, public administration, politics, uh, and other fields of study programs. Uh, part of the uh, study programs are already taught uh, in English language. We also have ideas for new study programs. For example, we, we are currently considering uh, a new potential bachelor degree programs in politics and Japanese language. I hope this idea maybe will be implemented through the cooperation of our universities. Uh, also, uh, 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 as it was discussed today, uh, as it was not discussed already today, additional areas of cooperation can be considered. What about sustainability and cybersecurity? Uh, cyber security is a category that plays a very important role in modern society. Uh, cybersecurity experts and even uh, the World Economic Forum uh, clearly see cybersecurity as an environment, environmental, uh, social and governance issue. Uh, cybersecurity can also be examined through the aspects of corporate sustainability as well. And it's an innovative approach to cyber to sustainability. Uh, by the way, uh, about similarities. Uh, according to the Global ITU Cybersecurity Index, uh, Lithuania and Japan rank uh, right next to each other in this ranking. Uh, EI 7th uh, and 6th place uh, respectively. Uh, so, uh, both countries have achieved a lot in terms of cybersecurity. And at the same time, I believe uh, the experience in cybersecurity field of each country is unique. Uh, uh, therefore, Japan and Lithuania could uh, and should uh, also share experience in the field of cybersecurity as well. And our universities could be maybe a suitable platform uh, for this. Uh, what's more, in February of this year, we opened an Australian-Lithuanian cyber research network with Australian RMIT University. And on December 13th, in addition, we will launch Australian-Lithuanian hybrid threat uh, center. Uh, uh, currently, both Lithuania and Australia experience hybrid uh, cyber threats only from different uh, sources. Uh, uh, Russia and China, respectively, and uh, are looking for ways to cooperate and adopt uh, each other's experience. And uh, hybrid cyber warfare become, became uh, strongly recognized as a threat. Perhaps uh, Japan would also like to join maybe similar initiatives and uh, form 
one of the course uh, of cooperation. Uh, uh, this is just an example that shows that we are ready for new initiatives. Uh, we have ideas, we have, and we will be happy to cooperate further and implement some uh, ideas. So I hope uh, it will not be difficult to find even more synergy between our institutions and, and, and faculties. It does not matter where uh, and whether it is related to studies, science uh, or students, teacher exchange, the partnership between Japanese and Lusania universities. Uh, it's also an opportunity for further intercultural exchange. Uh, I would like to believe that uh, our university and the Faculty of Public Governance and Business and other faculties of our university and the Graduate School of International Administration uh, will further develop uh, excellent uh, network of academic relations between Japan and Lithuania. And this network will further foster cooperation between our countries. I also want to point out that we believe that uh, uh, for doing something valuable, and meaningful, it's, an, it's a very important long-term partnership. Uh, this is what we expect together with Graduate School of International Administration. Uh, Japan is one of the Lithuania's strate strategic partners, so our desire uh, is to develop cooperation uh, is not uncommon, but well uh, sought and uh, out and discussed. So thank you, your excellent rectors. Uh, thank you, uh, other honor guests, uh, the speakers. Uh, thank you uh, to our uh, uh, meeting organizers, uh, as well as thanks to technical staff. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated in uh, this event. We hope that this event will lead uh, to further meaningful and long-lasting uh, partnership between our universities as well as countries itself. Thank you all, and maybe see you next time. Thank you very much, dear Dean. And so the final word goes to Dr. Goro. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Oldra-san. Uh, Today, we, uh, we believe we had a great day. Uh, we thank that uh, Dr. Itna, our uh, rector uh, of MRU and Ambassador Ozaki and uh, uh, Dr. Odres of uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Lithuania and our president, uh, Kenji Sugibayashi for the speech. Uh, and we also thank uh, that the, all the presenters here today uh, if you feel that there are some problems today, the problems are all ours. Uh, we must say that in the background, uh, Audra san and Yaroslav san uh, both help us really, really a lot. So we owe the success of today's session to uh, both of you. Uh, thank you so much. It was a great day, and we hope we keep tightening our relationships together. Thank you so much. So thank you once uh, once again. Thank you very much. It was really insightful and a great event. And um, well, let us consider the event closed. <laughs>